the star that I want to start with in this story is going to be the imaginary golden mane shield. Okay, super cool name, of course. Our symbol is the same symbol we have for the golden ratio with a subscript I, or imaginary. All right, now, it's a geometric number that informs us of many things. First thing is that we're dividing our domain into six pieces. So the imaginary golden ratio is equal to negative one to one third. Compare this to I, which is equal to negative one to one half. Okay, so it's extremely geometric in the same way that I is geometric. But there is a difference between I and the imaginary golden ratio. The thing that stands out right away is that in the way that I depends on multiples of two, the imaginary golden ratio depends on multiples of three. Right? And we can visualize this quite easily, so we know exactly what we're talking about. We get a, a unit circle here with radius 1. If we're dividing things using i, then that means we've divided to here, here, here. The pizza has four pieces. Okay, so that, and we, that can be restated by i to the fourth equals 1, because that brings us back to 1, as we started out at 1. Okay? Oh, sorry. In the same way, we're going to now use the imaginary golden ratio to instead divide up the circle into six pieces. It takes three to get halfway around, or flip. It takes three to flip. Okay, But this is really now six in total. So the first one is about here. That's the imaginary golden ratio. Next one here is the imaginary golden ratio squared. And then next one is here, which is the imaginary golden ratio cubed. And then down here, imaginary golden ratio to the fourth. And then down here, imaginary golden ratio to the fifth. And then back to here, which is imaginary golden ratio to the sixth, or imaginary golden ratio to zero. This was to one. So a very modular way of talking about dividing up, because then it repeats, right? You can go over and over if you wanted, but it's... In general, a thing that constructively divides a circle into six pieces. Great. This one divides things into four pieces. All right, so if we're going to use these to do something, try to remember that using them means you're incorporating something that now divides six ways or four ways. So bringing them into the picture means you hopefully doing them, bringing them in to do that, because <laughs> that's what they do. Okay, the, the first exciting thing about these numbers is that they become the operative or rotational bases that geometrically construct a form that's super exciting in geometry. A form that defines the smallest possible stable form you can have, double cover of a three manifold. So the hyperbolic figure eight naught. Our equation for the hyperbolic figure eight naught, let me build it up in pieces. So let's start with a dialog rhythm of the imaginary golden ratio. Okay? Dialog rhythm of the thing that divides things into six ways. And we're going to ask, what is it? This thing is two parts. It's complex. So the output is a two-part number. It has a, a real part or a one-dimensional part, and a different dimensional 90 degrees part for the complex. But it has an I attached to that one. So the first part is equal to 4 pi divided by gamma of 5 squared. The real part of the dialog rhythmic construction using the thing that divides things six ways is a sphere divided up hyperbolically five ways squarely. The whole thing squared. Now that's only half the story. That's what we call the real part of this complex number, right? The, uh, yep, plus the imaginary part is the Gieskin constant 
Use King constant times I. This is the imaginary part of this dialogue rhythmic construction. Okay, a magical thing that the imaginary golden ratio can do. <laughs> it can break things up in a completely two different two-dimensional ways. So this is two different expressions, but these expressions are both extremely interesting. The imaginary component is nothing but the Gieskine manifold itself. Right? This is the constant that alerts you to <laughs> having the Gieskine manifold. So the imaginary part of this construction is the minimal manifold. Oh, that's an interesting thing. <laughs> right? How about the other part? The real part of the same construction, these two come together, right? Orthogonally exist, meaning so they're going to be like interfacing each other or responsible for each other. This might be inside and outside, you think, of the same expression. But this one is just, we know what that is. We don't really know this. We don't have a picture these days for that. We're here desperately after the exact picture of this, right? But here, whenever we find where it plays its role, we get the clues. And the clues are that orthogonally to this manifold is this structure. So this guy is orthogonal to this. If you know what this looks like, you know what that looks like. <laughs> Big deal. Okay. So here's our, our first structure. But look, if we do a symmetric thing, you notice these have several important features here. First of all, at this point, it's negative one, right? And that's, if we were using i instead, we go i for one and i squared back to negative one. So we, we match at, the, at negative one there. Let me state that explicitly. So i squared equals negative one and our imaginary golden ratio cubed equals negative one. Right now, if there's another place they match, and this happens every time you go around, so then there's multiple matches between this. You can imagine generalizing it, but there's another place they match. It's over here. So i to the fourth. It takes four times for i to get back equals one. Oh, I just wrote that over there. But then imaginary golden ratio to the sixth equals one. Okay. Another thing, another way of representing this. Imaginary golden ratio to the fifth is one over imaginary golden ratio. It's like rotating the other direction in steps of the imaginary golden ratio. Okay. So I want to just look at the symmetric piece of this so we can kind of look into the whole story a little bit more and see what happens. Let's take the dialogue rhythm. This is a polylog rhythm of order two or a two-dimensional logarithm. Okay. So we're logarithmically constructing things, but twice. In this story, that's another piece of the story actually. Let's take the inverse imaginary golden ratio, one over. Okay, it's another piece in our recursive story here that shows up every time you go around, but I'm going to represent it just this simply way, this simple way. Okay, now it turns out to equal 4 pi over gamma of 5 squared minus GGI I. Okay. That's pretty cool, right? <laughs> okay, what what what's what are you seeing in that? It's coming into existence and it's negating itself. Yeah. It's Part of it is. Let's take this one and subtract from it this one. Right? Let's take Li2 of 1 over and minus the first one. Let's see what the difference between them is. <laughs> and, well, we're going to get this one minus this one in the real component. Oh, it goes away. Yeah. Zero for that part. Okay. This one minus this one, what do we get? Minus 2GGI times I. Okay. Now, what if you multiply this whole thing by one more 90 degree rotation? 
by i, what happens? We don't need this zero. What if we multiply this by i? Well, we already have an i. i times i becomes negative 1, canceling this negative 1. So both this and this goes away so if, we, if we do this. And 2 gGi is exactly the hyperbolic figure 8 naught. So the structure we're talking about, the one that we believe is at the constructive center, not just the constructive center, but determines all the base rules and connections of everything that follows, is this hyperbolic figure 8 naught. And it comes from just an operator that divides the circle, the unit circle, six ways, using it both of these ways and taking the difference. So the difference between both of these is this. What else is left over everywhere else? Well, <laughs> these parts. If you look at a partial picture of the, of the domain, this is if you look at the whole picture, if you look at a partial, partial, partial picture, you're going to be intersecting these constructive kinds of ways of cutting things up, right? Okay. Okay, that's step one. If we step in a different direction here, we did this power and this power. What if we want to go to this one and this one symmetrically? Okay. Well, that's the same thing as now squaring. Let me write it separately. Squared minus, and this one's squared also. You see what we changed? We just changed the argument that we're putting in the dialog rhythms, but we're still taking the difference between them. So we're doing the same thing we did when we were constructing the hyperbolic figure in that, but we're using that argument's necessarily other pieces. Those pieces have to be in the story if you divided the whole thing into a circle in order to make this one <laughs> into six pieces. Sorry, if you divided the circle into six pieces, all of those pieces have to play a role. But notice this one plays a role very familiar, right? That's already taken. <laughs> this one plays a role very familiar. So we're checking the other two, right? Or sorry, the other role. We checked this one, now we're checking these. And what do we get? Any guesses? That's uh, be two VFD. Two thirds. Very good. Um, if you go up another power, by the way, if you go cubed, then this goes to zero. Okay, so it equals zero. If we tried the exact same thing, we put in i right here. Instead of the imaginary golden ratio, we put in the imaginary unit. Okay, so we just put in i and i. Now we get another very familiar number to geometers or mathematicians. The Catalan constant. In fact, two times the Catalan constant. So it becomes... 2 times, this is represented as C and G and K and different script things. Just, I'm just going to go with K. It's the Catalan constant, the, the famous one. So at some other orthogonal direction to the same construction, this Catalan construction is coming in too. Okay, that's the story here. That They're tied together in the same story. If you go up in powers with... I, so if we have I still in there and we made this move, so we became I squared here and there, then it goes to zero, just like this one did when it was cubed. See? Because no. of the symmetry there. They both landed there right then. Yeah. Okay. That's a start. So we really care about a few characters. Let's keep a track here. We have the imaginary golden ratio. We have... The imaginary unit. Let's talk now a little bit about the golden ratio because it's not just marketing that gets this guy's name, the imaginary golden ratio. That's just someone trying to pick a cool name. It actually is really, really related to the golden ratio. 
In fact, it's really related to I and the golden ratio. The three of them are bound together. And in fact, the three of them also have a lot of ex really cool expressions with E and pi and so on. So we're going to try to get exposed to a little bit of those. But I didn't write this one down. This one's VFE, which is equal to 2 times the Gieskin constant. Right? And then when we change it to I, it becomes 2 times the Catalan constant. So the Gieskin constant and the Catalan constant have a relationship. Beautiful. Let's um, note a couple other relationships here real quick with I. So if I take the magnitude of I, it's equal to the magnitude of the imaginary golden ratio. Oh, yeah. And that's both equal to 1. So it is a unit circle divider. Its radius carrying around is still 1. Even though it's up here, it still has a radius of 1. Okay? So their magnitudes are equal. So they have a, a built-in relationship. The golden ratio is equal to a ratio of A over B such that A plus B over A returns itself. So this divisor is equal to A plus B over A. The imaginary golden ratio is defined when A over B is equal to I guess. So far it's the same. How could it be as similar as possible? Okay, minus B. Uh -huh. A minus B over A. It's almost the exact same built-in algebraic connection. You see what I'm saying? In fact, it's the opposite one. If you have a balance system that has this connection, you would expect that system somewhere else to have, or somewhere just there, to have the opposite. So they come together, right? Okay. <laughs> um, let's do... Here's a cool one. Let's do the golden ratio plus 1 is equal to the golden ratio squared. This is an algebraic truth. So... This is something that's true in numbers, okay? And the goal is to figure out how to know what that's telling us about reality, what the geometric structure that this is talking about in reality. It's logically there. <laughs> so figuring out what it means is the goal. Here's another symmetry. The golden ratio minus 1 is equal to 1 over the golden ratio. So it's a thing that talks about itself quite a lot. Do you see what I mean? There's a lot of simple relationships that bring it back to itself, just in maybe a slightly different form, but not very far away. <laughs> it's not to the 112th, some weird connection like that. It's just two. It's got some simple basic relationships built in. All right. Let's do another one that's mind-blowing. Let's connect. I guess I'm going to have to erase this part. We have, before I do, the Catalan constant. Um, we have the Gieskin constant. We have VFE, the hyperbolic figure eight knot. Anything else that I'm about to erase? I is already in there. Okay. Now we have pi, 4 pi, and we have the gamma function. Okay. So far, isn't it really intriguing that there's this algebraic number? It's also a, a geometric number that exists, but it has all of these true statements about it. It possesses these things. <laughs> really, really cool. Let's do the square root of 1 squared. 
This is a kind of cool symmetry. It just gives you one. Okay. But now I'm going to say we did, we're going to do it fractally. <laughs> so plus square root of one squared plus the square root of one squared and so on. Okay. Turns out that's exactly equal to the golden ratio. The golden ratio. Yeah. That's a constructive way to get there. So this golden ratio with its magical algebraic properties, these built-in relationships, owns this too. <laughs> it also is this all the time in some way. Okay. Well, interestingly, there's another relationship of this kind between the golden ratio and the imaginary golden ratio marrying all three with, again, I. One squared could have been negative one squared, I guess. Right? I could have put negative one squared and it would have also been positive. But what I could have done to really change it is make it I squared. I squared. In this case, the whole thing gives us the imaginary golden ratio. Now, it, this form marries all three, the golden ratio, the imaginary golden ratio, and the imaginary unit many, many <laughs> infinite times, really, right? So we know for sure in our geometry we're interested in the imaginary golden ratio and I. We know that for sure, because our constructive form uses those and only those as its operational divisors to construct itself. These other things follow, but now we should be really, really sure that the golden ratio is constructively part of what we're interested in, too. Because these things are married. <laughs> They're all together, right? They define each other in a beautiful simply geometric this is a fractally or hierarchical way but it's still simply geometric or i can write down in a closed form further and further you go on this and repeating this the more and more digits that you get right of this thing right and so you just specify how many you need and it tells you how far to go but yes you're not going to get all the digits ever because it's an irrational number all right so the only way we can know irrational numbers is by specifying their closed forms, by specifying the relationship that allows you to calculate the digits out to some sort of accuracy, right? And the claim is all of those relationships give you the same string of digits out to whatever number you want interested in the digits, but they still have to specify the relationship that takes you there. Okay, so the relationships in these irrational numbers are their value. <laughs> That's all they are. They are that relationship, that there's a certain constructive relationship kept, that there's a form held, is what they're relating to us. Okay. I can also be written in terms of rotations, right? E to the pi I over 2. And this pi over 2 part is Q and U N, that it's this rotation there. Okay. So that's equivalent. If we want to do the same thing for the imaginary golden ratio, you probably already know how now, right? It's going to be e to the pi i over 3. Right? Because we don't rotate half of a flip. We rotate a third of a flip. Okay, so here's two ways to write these two guys. And we're saying that all three of these parameters are married. So you might ask, what about that guy? Does he have a rotational equivalent? Can I write the, the golden ratio is equal to e to the pi i over something? That's a good question. What do you think? I'm not getting an image at all. <laughs> Okay, turns out it does, the answer is no, but 
if I put a 5 here instead, plus e to the minus pi i over 5, now it's true. Oh, that's right, yeah. Okay. That's another, another, this is a rotational marriage between these three parameters, these three geometric algebraic descriptors of what? Of some sort of structure. In our, in our case, the structure that we think is defining the actual shape of reality, the physics shape of the universe. <laughs> isn't, isn't that like another variation, like the super golden ratio or the complex golden ratio or one of those guys? Yeah, yeah. In fact, like two times this yeah. was the complex golden ratio. Yeah, that's another cool thing. So there's another, there are other, there's many other relationships that these things all touch. Right now I'm focusing on the one, the ones right between them, right? But this piece and this piece, well, they have a minus sign here. But if you can imagine they were both positive and you added them together. So now it was two of that. Two e to the pi i over five is the, what's the script for that? Complex. It was this. It was um, complex. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 The complex golden ratio. But we think since this character is in our geometry, <laughs> it's playing in a really inherent role. So I'm interested in all the ways that these things connect, the things they can tell us. The first thing I notice is we have a denominator of 2 and 3. If I added those together, I'd get 5. Right? So I can see some sort of way of putting these together. Both of these pieces are put together in some anti-symmetric way. We're going to take a sum from n equals 0 to infinity of golden ratio to negative n. So this looks like 1 over golden ratio to the negative 0 plus 1 over the golden ratio to the negative, or sorry, not negative anymore because it's already in the denominator. Denominator, or the negative brings it in the denominator. Okay? We start from 0 and we count up. Plus 1 over the golden ratio squared plus 1 over the golden ratio cubed plus 1 over all, and so on. That's what this is shorthand for. Okay, so we're taking all the inverse powers of the golden ratio itself. Like we're counting up golden ratio moves, whatever a golden ratio move is, we're counting them up inversely in powers and asking if you get to do that all the way, take advantage of all the things that those could do and sum them up, what would it give you in total? I'm going to go with something cool. Something cool. Remember, the golden ratio loves to talk about itself. Oh. This is kind of funny. Didn't we say we were taking an infinite number of these inverse things? So we have an infinite number of these golden ratio pieces involved. And we end up with just two pieces. <laughs> This is a form, a thing in and to itself that factors infinitely into a square. That's really an interesting number. This, same, this is the same number we've been talking about the whole time, right? <laughs> that, I mean, we've been introduced to three of them already, but there's a corollary to this. There's another number in existence that I haven't mentioned yet called the super golden ratio, and it looks like psi. It is from n equals 0 to infinity again of the super golden ratio to the negative n. So same exact equation, but a different base. Okay, And this number, as we do the same sort of thing, factor it all out to those, turns out, turns out to talk about itself again, cubed. Okay, just that there is something 
that factors infinitely into three copies and infinitely into two copies is really interesting. Did I erase anything important there? We also have E here. Pi, that's it all there. Okay. The dialogue Yeah, we, we also care about logarithms. This is natural logarithm. And then poly logarithms. I can make that a mess. There we go. And like x of n. So poly logarithms are just more complicated versions of logarithms. I'm trying to motivate your interest in these numbers because these numbers are inherently inexplicably. We can't take them out. We've been talking about this one a lot and this one and this one primarily, right? Those are the relationships. And they, these two together give us that one and that one and that one, <laughs> right? Oh, we had this one pop up already too with the gamma five, right? So let's talk about the gamma function a little bit more. It's got an inbuilt symmetry. We go x plus one and set it equal to itself, except for the other version. Okay, then that is true in the gamma function. Remember the gamma function is our important function in what? It's the base function in mathematics for dividing things up, right? Yeah, for partitions. Yeah, we have uh, factorials, and this is the analytically continued version of factorials, okay, in math. Uh, they're equal because they're doing the same thing but going the other way. Yeah, yeah, we're setting, we're just imagining up the gamma function and setting it equal to another copy of the gamma function and asking about some traits inside of it and say, hey, if you're, we could have done x equals gamma equals x, but then we didn't do anything interesting, right? Now we're going to say, okay, let's let's separate the arguments and say, is there a place that's in relation to 1 symmetrically in the gamma function? Is there an x that works like that? And turns out that the x that works, there's two of them. This one and this one. Interesting, right? This is built into how things partition. Beautiful. So there's even more of a reason to try to understand the structure of these numbers because how things partition, even down to the logic of how things partition, is set by these. It's, there's a balance in the gamma function, balancing on these. These are the roots. Okay. Now, in keeping with our previous discussion, let me just write it below. So that's that case. Let's pick another case close to this. That's a balance that gave us a really cool case. What if I'm trying to look kind of exactly opposite of that in the same gamma function? X plus one set equal to exactly opposite of that. I didn't change the form. All I did is add this negative sign, okay? And now we ask, what are we gonna get? This squared and this squared or what? Yes. Now it's the imaginary golden ratio and one over the imaginary golden ratio. Positive, not negative. This time it's negative, that time it's positive. Okay, so in the gamma function, we're trying to draw some conclusions about structural things in the math. Right now the gamma function has a symmetry, a unitary symmetry. It's in relation to the number one and then it has a symmetry with the golden ratio, negative one over the golden ratio, the imaginary golden ratio, and one over the imaginary golden ratio. Remember, these were what? Literally our roots in our hyperbolic figure eight knot equation. Okay, so that means the gamma function itself is literally the thing that's dividing up the projection from the hyperbolic figure eight knot. I hope that that might have been jumping a lot of steps there, but you at least see a connection. The gamma function's balance, one of its two balances, literally have the same are the same arguments that dialogarithmically construct the hyperbolic figure eight knot. That's really neat. <laughs> That's really neat. That's so when we look into the gamma function, we're looking into a uh, 
a thing that's related to the construction of the hyperbolic figure eight knot. There. Here's another cool connection then. If I take gamma of 1 plus x and gamma of 1 minus x together, take an integral from 0 to 1 half of both of those together. So dx, I need a dx here. Okay, and then I multiply it by pi over 2. You're starting to be a little less lost of why I throw these random things up. It feels random at first, right? But I'm trying to show that we have constructive relationships in the logic of math related to our forms, to our geometry. Okay, this thing gives us the Catalan constant, right? Which we already have up there. The fourth one up there. This is the Catalan constant. But look what, where it's coming from. Putting two of these together. There's a relationship between the golden ratio, because these two are made in this, right? Pi and the Catalan constant. Another, which is directly related to the hyperbolic figure eight, not again. Okay, so all of these things are intimate. So Catalan constant is equal to pi times the domino tiling constant. So it has a direct pi relationship to the domino tiling constant. Another thing then we're going to be very interested in, right? It also has, um, that's not, well, I could do it this way, 2k This is the dimmer constant. So the domino tiling constant, the dimmer constant, they're all transforms of each other in this hyperbolic structure. Okay. I think I had, oh, yep. In fact, there's another one we can do. We can go, we can do the same thing here, but change x to x over 2 in both cases and put pi over 4 here. And we again get the Catalan constant. 0 to 1. Pi over 4, gamma of 1 plus x, gamma of 1 minus x, dx. Again, equals the Catalan constant. What you're trying to do is point your consciousness at this. So it starts picking up on features that are similar between these relationships so that the conversation continues in your own mind. Right? You need to be interested enough as the first feature. <laughs> and what we're saying is that we have a constructive relationship connecting the geometry we most care about to at least these numbers, at least these forms. Did I add any more here now? Oh, we got the dimmer constant, the domino tiling constant. I already have pi and Catalan. That's it, right? Okay. Now, something a little new. We had, at the very beginning, when we talk about how we build the hyperbolic figure eight knot, what was the right, or the, sorry, the left component, the real component from the dialog rhythms? Do you remember? That was the uh, four pi over gamma Yep. Good. Yep. So we really cared about this four pi over gamma of five squared. That was half of the story, or orthogonal to the Gieskin manifold. So we care about this. All right. Let's talk about a relationship of the gamma function to dividing a circle. Okay, when we divide up a circle, we algebraically, one way we'll do it is we'll say cosine squared of x plus sine squared of x, right? We'll break it up into sines and cosines. Okay, that's... When we draw, well, I don't need to erase that. When we draw our unit circle, we, we can get the cosines, the sine angles all on the unit circle, right? And it's a relationship built into that. All right. The thing we were interested in, what are all the features here? Since we know we have unit circles, <laughs> right? we have the imaginary golden ratio and we have I. So we have two things that agree. There's something happening with a unit radius. We need to now draw a sine wave and a cosine wave. So let's see, like that. And keep going. But 
the features in the sine wave, in the unit sine wave, meaning I'm going to cut it off, start at zero, we're going to go until we get one whole wave that's at two pi, right? Literally the distance of the x-axis by definition is two pi, and the height is one. And then dip, the minimum, is negative one. This is the unit wave, right? So we have the unit wave, and its features are not just pi, but let's add 2 pi as being important here. That's a good one. Oh, we also have 4 pi, fundamentally important here. So we care about those multiples. But 2 pi is this distance, not this distance. 1, negative 1. Maybe we should throw those in here too. Of course, negative 1 and... One really matter. Zero really matters. <laughs> okay. What else? Well, we've done this a couple of times before, so you guys already know. We'll just go to the punchline. The actual length of this unit wave, which think when you're using waves, you can scale them by any parameter, then use them. But you'll still have a unit in that. So there's going to be this multiple compared to your unit that you scaled it by in your system. What is that thing? What is that? value compared to one what is this length <laughs> and it turns out i'm going to give it a name i don't know if it has any symbol so please if someone knows if this has an official symbol let me know but i'm going to call it the length arc length of the sine wave let's call it that for now and it turns out of course that this is equal to the arc length of the cosine wave so we're dividing a circle into cosines and sines, then both times we're going to be using this number. Okay, They're equal to each other. It's also equal to something else in geometry that we already have up here, but there's another missing piece. It's equal to 4 pi divided by s plus s. Okay. S is the arc length of the unitary lemnus gate, not the unitary circle, the unitary lemnus gate, which starts again at 1, goes to negative 1, so here's 1 and negative 1, and instead of going all the way up to the circle, it goes like this. It has a twist. It was a circle that was twisted, a unit circle that was twisted. <laughs> it actually looks like a sine wave out of phase. It looks like an infinity sign. Or infinity, but yeah. you, know, you can look at it as... So, so S equals this whole arc length. If I start, say, here, here and go all the way around and put a string down to there, it doesn't matter where I start. I could have started right here, right, and go all the way around until I get back to there. The whole length in this structure is important. Just like in a unit circle, its, rate, its circumference is an important part of the story about the circle. Okay? All right, so S is this whole length, uh, arc length, of the unitary lemnus gate, and L, also in this picture, so we're going to bring them into the story now, L, L1, L2, Gauss's constant, the ubiquitous constant, oh, that's CU, I think, yeah. these are all now constants related to the lemnus gate, okay? Directly, in fact, they're not that hard to find. S is the whole thing, whole length. L equals S over 2. One pedal. One pedal. L1 equals L over 2, which equals S over 4. One wave. Yep, or from here to there, from here to here. From here to here. So note that it's fourfold symmetric in its length. You can go any direction from the center to get one of those four, and it's the same value, and it's this number. Okay? L2 is pi over s. GGA is, maybe I should write them in other order, for room CU equals the square root of 2 times L2. And then GGA, which is Gauss's constant, S over 2 pi. All right, 
First thing is, you should be quite excited by these numbers. These are algebraic geometric numbers that prescribe something built into the world, built into how unit circles divide or the unit wave is constructed. <laughs> so any wave would have some relationship to this number, right? Just do a scaling after that. Okay. These numbers, S, L, L1, L2, C, U, G, G, A, C, D, 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 all of these numbers are ones that show up in our concepts of nature, right? Over and over and over. These are very built into the whole structure. The golden ratio also has another way to talk about it in terms of the continued fraction. We didn't even touch that, did we? There's so many things. <laughs> we didn't talk about continued fractions, right? Okay, well, we have talked about them before. Let's see, it's... Uh, let me just talk about them instead of writing them because they're really hard to write. So the golden ratio itself defines the unitary continued fraction. So it's the continued fraction whose elements are all one all the way down. And a continued fraction, I do have to draw the first one. The continued fraction starts one, it has a, a special character that's first. And then we add one over, so we're gonna do a division, one plus one over one plus one over one, and you can keep going. Okay, in the case that we do it the way I just wrote, where all the elements up top and all the elements at bottom are ones, then the whole thing's literally equal to the golden ratio. <laughs> okay, so the continued fraction form is really interesting to us because we already believe that the golden ratio is part of the story. All right, now the question is, what exactly is the story of the continued fraction? Okay, it's related directly to all sinusoidal spirals. There's a, there's a recursion, well, Ramanujan also showed another way, but there's a recursion in continued fractions that is based on, very heavily based on, symmetry between pi and L. This pi, this L, which kind of implies all these other ones are playing roles too because they're stuck to it. <laughs> okay. Um, there are beautiful, I'll put them on the screen for the video here, beautiful, beautiful continued fractions for the golden ratio. It's inverse, which just deletes the first one into a zero. So it changes zero, and this turns into one over the golden ratio. Keep all the other ones, just the first one turns to zero. The, the Ramanujan's first continued fraction is a really interesting way to take advantage of the continued fraction form. So it changes, instead of the ones on top here, it's doing an e to the negative 2 pi multiples all the way down on top. Okay, and it leaves all the bottom ones one. So it leaves all these ones and it changes the tops to e to the negative two pi, e to the negative four pi, e to the negative six pi. So another rotation every time you come back around to another level. Okay, so we're trying to interpret what's going on. That's a, a continued fraction that's gorgeous and is using the continued fraction form in a very specific way. You can probably imagine some part of the story there that there's a whole rotation involved every time you go to another level. Pi over 2 can be found by taking all 1s over up top. And then, where do we start? This is 1, and this becomes 1 over 1, 1 over 2, 1 over 3, 1 over 4, all the way down. The simple fractions, okay? In this, from here on, all the denominators are just the whole set of simple fractions. And we get pi over 2. So the continued fraction form is intrinsically, intrinsically geometric. Okay, so I guess the main, main story is there's, there's also the main continued fraction numbers would be the golden ratio because it's the unitary continued fraction form, okay? But then after that, I would say pi and L are the ones that are the, the three most important in the continued fraction. If there has to be another one, I'm going to bring up the Catalan constant because it has simple, simple, simple structure. For other ones that are important, they wouldn't be a constant. It would be more like a, a form, like the tangent function, 
So the tangent function is also directly related to the continued fraction form, which is a really good clue because the tangent function is one of the hyperbolic functions, right? Tangent is, means you're <laughs> barely touching something, okay, at each point. All right, um, I think that's the main thing I wanted to, to come to. It's, it's a new idea for me to now think that maybe the continued fraction form of doing something that's one operation and then a different operation, and then the first operation, and then the second, and then first, second, first, second. You have a, two operations that you repeat forever and do something geometric in the collection. So this is a beautiful recursive. So as far as stipulating the recursive information, it's short, right? But it's a lot of actual information that you build in those two steps recursively. <laughs> um, what if this and this were written the other way? <laughs> it's totally fine to say that. Let's do it like that. Let's say s plus 4 pi over s. Same thing. Now, all of a sudden, I'm seeing something that's added and divided. And what if you just did that recursively? What if you used the thing that's dividing unit circles up already, this arc length itself, to do the work of twisting together the structure via this form? You see what I'm saying? We have a plus and we have a divide. Yeah. What if we have a over and over and over added to that? And also we need a geometric way of closing ourselves. So maybe this is our way of arranging and fitting into ourselves using this twisting back and forth inside the circle. Anyway, I don't have a full story that, I, as I told you at the beginning, I'm not going to a specific end. What I wanted to do is spend some time re-familiarizing ourselves with some of our superstars, the characters that we know are in the story, so we, it, we're not going to be wasting our time by getting to know them better. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully it leads to some questions or uh, things to look up that will carry the story further, right? Because we want the exact story here. We're not going to just stop until we do, because we need it. We need to know what's recursively connecting things in the whole logic. We need to know, because if we don't get that right, we're not going to get to build something in a universal replicator. We have to tell it something to do that it can then do over and over and over. The script itself can't be longer than the thing we want done, right? It needs to be a short script that recursively performs itself. That's the only way we're getting where we're going, because that's what nature is doing with DNA, right? Short script that does phenomenally amount of things. <laughs> all right, so yeah, this isn't all the connections, of course. There's hundreds of beautiful connections in mathematics between these constants, but these are all central constants in mathematics, right? In geometry, in algebraic geometry. So all the sinusoidal spirals are related to them. I mean, that's all the familiar forms that most people have been introduced to, <laughs> right? We can, uh, we've been dying in a tree. <laughs> all right, that's the kind of end of my lecture, or semi-lecture. just wanted to talk about it. But it's really interesting, right? This just divided up the circle in the way that we were already taught in school in the cosines and sines implies a feature in that division that we should talk about, this one. That other feature, that, that link. And it's going to be there twice, right? So now if we have it there and there, maybe the two of them together are intersecting and countering each other to keep the whole system balancing. I'm trying to get closer and closer to visualizing what's actually going on. But I guess what I'm suggesting very specifically is that what's going on is going to be involving one of those and whatever it means to take a sphere and divide it by a lemnus gate. Okay, so... I mean, that just looks like the initial construction. Of it does. Figure if not. It you does. Pi <laughs> divided well, right there. Mm -hmm. of that, and that's like just the imaginary uh, GGI there. Also, it's incredibly compatible with the squaring component in this feature. This had to be squared in our number. In both ways, it was squared, and then it canceled out, right? So there's some square locking happening there. S's are squared. If you zoom in here, these things are crossing at 90 degrees. Okay, so if you have a lemnus gate, in the system, it's, so you have a square. You have two of them, you got two squares. Interesting, a very, very compatible story. Um, we, of course, want more details. We want 
visual animations because even if you get the whole story right you're going to forget part of it tomorrow until you get it <laughs> animated and you can remind yourself and keep going further but anyway this is it this is a a lot of beautiful connections in i'd say that's roughly what a third of all the numbers we need to get familiar with pretty much yeah so that's <laughs> It's limited. <laughs> it's a beautiful start of connections and stories. I think we can go a lot further. In fact, we need to go a lot further. So.